Hello, I'm Too Tight the Trek, and welcome back to the Shaky Sonnet Show. We're here in the sanitarium at the bottom of the down staircase in the permanently sequestered remainder section of an unnamed local library, which may or may not have some lion couchant just sitting on the steps doing absolutely nothing as if they were made of stone or something. But today, we are back to onesies. We're going to be looking at Sonnet 39. We were lost, but now we're found. And we'll look at Sonnet 39 after returning from the land of misplaced sonnets, Sonnets 37 and 38. And I will talk again about Shakespeare's, I'm sorry, about um, Paul Edmondson and Stanley Wells, uh, version in which they they give a chronology of the Shakespeare science and the order in which they believe that they were written. But they don't say why they believe they were written in this order, and they do place 37 and 38 between 36 and 39, and I don't quite get it still. Um, I would have liked a little bit more information about that. Perhaps it's somewhere floating around in the universe, but I haven't yet been able to find it. So. Some scholars say that because of the repetition of certain lines in Sonnet 36 and 39, Twain and Remain, One and Alone, and Thee and Me, that Sonnet 39 actually reads like the second half of Sonnet 36, with which I completely disagree. Um, a progression, yes. A second part, no. Sonnet 36 is a definite breakup. We too must be Twain. And 39 is more of a backtracking, kind of like when you find out your lover has been doing a little something something on the side, and um, while 36 is I hate you, 39 is, well, it was just sex, right? So that's what my vision of Sonnet 39 is. And what comes between Sonnet 30, what comes between 36 and 39 or 37 and 38, which is just someone out walking barefoot in the snow, mumbling to himself about decrepit fathers and ten muses and all kinds of nonsense. So we'll jump right in and we'll look at Sonnet 39 and I'll read it first and then we'll look a little bit more closely at it. Oh, how thy worth with manners may I sing when thou art all the better part of me. What can mine own praise to mine own self bring? And what is it but mine own when I praise thee? Even for this, let us divided live, and our dear love lose name of single one, that by this separation I may give that due to thee which thou deservest alone. O oh, absence, what a torment wouldst thou prove were it not thy sour leisure gave sweet leave to entertain the time with thoughts of love, which time and thoughts so sweetly dost deceive and that thou teachest how to make one twain by praising him here who doth hence remain. So we have here again a couple of interesting things. Oh, how thy worth with manners may I sing. Um, there's, it implies how can I, how can I, how can thy worth with manners sing. and. Um, with manners meaning bragging but politely. How can I praise you when you're the better part of me? So if I praise you, then I'm praising myself as well. And how can I do that and still be mannerly? Because what can I say to you that could praise you that's more? What can mine own praise to mine own self bring? And what is it but mine own when I praise thee? Which is understandable enough. And then we get even for this, let us divided live, which is a little bit confusing. So even though we are one, let's separate. You know, how can I praise you? You're better than I am. And if I praise you, I'm praising myself. But still, let's, let's separate. Um, and if we separate, then I'll really appreciate you, is sort of what this is saying. Let us divided live, and our dear love lose name of single one, that by this separation I may give that due to thee which thou deservest alone. Well, so I guess if we separate, I'll think about you more in more endearing terms, and then maybe things will work out OK. And those are the first two quatrains which form an octet. And this is 
a poem that does seem to be split into an octet and a sestet because at line nine, O absence, it's not capitalized, but it should be. It's almost as if absence is personified. O absence, because the, the narrator is then speaking to absence and no longer to the lover. O absence, what a torment wouldst thou prove were it not thy sour leisure gave sweet leave to entertain the time with thoughts of love, which time and thoughts so sweetly dost deceive. So it's not phone sex exactly, but it's it's sort of, you know, we're going to have to keep our distance a little bit. And while while we're apart, I'll be thinking of you in my own special way. And he, still speaking to absence, and that thou teachest, so thou meaning absence, absence teachest how to make one twain by praising him here who doth hence remain. So we're, we're going to be apart, but absence makes the heart grow fonder. And it's interesting that this is cut into to line of eight and then, um, I'm sorry, a, an octet and then a sestet, um, rather than the quatrain, 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 couplet um, structure. So it's a, it's a strange little poem, and it's kind of glorifying the idea of being alone and glorifying in the pain that being alone brings when you're thinking about a loved one. And I do know what that must be like. To miss someone is can be a real pleasure because you're able to think about them without being bothered by their, you know, their smacking noises when they eat or whatever else the problem may be. Um, and I'm certain that there must be a term for this, this, this sin of enjoying sorrow. If there are any Catholics out there who uh, know it, it's not morose delectation because that's thinking about bad things that one might do. It's not schadenfreude, which is when you're happy when something bad happens to another person. And it's not the slough of despond. Um, it's, perhaps it's more like the pond of despond. I don't know. I'm saying maybe tristesse delectatio. Um, so I, I want, I'm looking for some sort of ornate um, name for this very common sin, which um, seems to be happening in here. So is this, are there males or females in here? The lover or the, the, the person to whom it's um, addressed there doesn't seem to be a, a, an identifiable gender. But in line 14, praising him here who doth hence remain, him here who doth, hence doth remain, seems to be talking about the, the narrator. So apparently we have a gender of the narrator. The poet seems to be a male for sure. It doesn't necessarily mean that this can't be said by a woman in some dramatic setting, but um, it seems pretty clear that this is the, the poet at least is a male. Now, dramatically, how might this work? Um, it's less of a love sonnet and more of a pre-divorce sonnet, more of a, like a, um, a prenup sonnet or a trying to make up but just not yet sonnet. Um, so there could be the separation that's spoken about here could actually be just simply physical distance. Because you're not here, I have to go on this trip because um, you're quarantining in London and I'm quarantining out um, at Stratford and we can't be together, but I'll think about you fondly in my own special way. Um, or, and it may not be a fracture of the relationship as it definitely seemed to be in, in Sonnet 36, but perhaps it is, and I'll miss you while you're gone, Sonnet. So in some way, shape, or form, they are separate and seem to be agreeing to be separate for quite some time, um, making one twain. So who were one flesh are now two separate people. Um, so in some sense, we've got part of a sonnet to a lover and part of a sonnet to absence. The, the poet is addressing 
both, and we don't know which he loves more at this point, the lover or, or the absence of the lover, or the whole idea of absence. I'd like to know what you think. This is a very, uh, it's a nice way to return to the narrative progression. It seems that, that there's maybe a reconciliation on the, on the horizon, or maybe a little bit more turbulence ahead. I don't really know, but um, we'll find out when we get to Sonnet 40. Meanwhile, leave your comments about what you think is going on here in the comment section. And although I've gotten a lot of, of uh, guff from uh, certain areas about my, my tagline that the world is full of wonder, because it is full of wonder, it's not that it's easy to pay attention, it's that it's not easy to pay attention. It's easy to walk right past, and sometimes you don't know what you've got till, you, till it's gone, just like in the sonnet. So while you're out in the world, Pay attention to what's there right now with you, and you'll see the wonder that is there. Until we meet again, I'm Too Tight to Check. Mm.